and welcome to episode number 12 of the Eliza Licious Show. I'm your host, Eliza Jankowski, a business administration student, a yoga teacher, marathon runner, and currently finishing my plant based nutritionist degree. I'm here to help you to achieve a healthier, happier, and more sustainable life. I'm also the creator of the Eliza Licious Show Instagram account, where I post delicious and nutritious plant based recipes. If you haven't checked it out, please do so. That's at Eliza Licious Show over on Instagram. I hope you all had a wonderful week of good vibes and I'm so grateful that you're tuning in with me today. So let's get started. All right, guys, today is actually a really special day simply because I have my first professional runner on the show. His name is Oliver. He's from Australia, but He's actually one of the first athletes who are training with the On Athletic Club in Boulder, Colorado. He's a super inspiring and talented runner. So let's dive right into it. So, yeah, I'm from Berlin. Where are you from? I am from Sydney, Australia. Um, but the nice. obviously with our OAC, it's kind of a cool story of how it all uh, came together. Um, so. Uh, Pretty much I started running when I was, when I was about 16 track professional, like running track uh, in Australia. And then I came over and did college in the United States at the university of Wisconsin. And then I kind of got a, a bit of a name for myself in the NCAA. Um, and then on running uh, kind of reached out to me and a few other boys um, from different nationalities as well to, to kind of build this group and, and base it in Boulder, Colorado and uh, trying to get the best talent um, out of the collegiate system. And then obviously uh, the, the group's release and, and everything about that and the on athletic club getting announced was, was a pretty cool thing. We did some pretty cool races uh, with what we could with COVID and, and obviously built this group together um, during, you know, the, the kind of quarantine um pandemic stages here in the states so it was pretty cool how we were able to uh get it all kind of linked together and uh build something that we're going to start this professional track uh club the first one for for on running so it was an exciting experience to be kind of at the foothold of it so yeah yeah nice that's super cool so you said that you're from sydney did you learn to surf in sydney or somewhere uh -huh. else. I read yeah. that you like to surf, so I have to uh -huh. ask because I was, like, I wasn't, when I was in Australia, I learned surfing in Noosa. Do you know Noosa? Uh, yeah, my grandfather has a house in Noosa, actually. <laughs> Noosa is one of my Ooh, favorite cool. places in the world. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that's interesting you say that. Uh, yeah, my family are, are religious surfers. I come from a coastal beach town uh, called Cronulla, which is about, about 40 minutes outside the Oh, main, I know that place. You know Cronulla? yeah i'm from there I'm, yeah I'm i was living I, there for a while really yeah that, i'm a uh, yeah. i'm from the from the shire i'm from cronulla so born and raised there until i came over to the states when i was uh 18 so uh yeah my family are religious surfers we surf a lot my grandfather um actually had a property up in noosa uh noosa heads is where we used to spend a lot of time i did a lot of surfing i swam quite a bit too i was a competitive swimmer before i ran so i swam and i did surf club as well at Noosa Heads. I have a relationship with there as well as my relationship at North Cronulla. Um, so yeah, no, that's a, that's a crazy uh, coincidence because I that's pretty much my home. So I'm from there and uh, we go up there most holidays because we love the area and we love to surf there. My mum, uh, since she was a child, grew up and went up to Noosa quite a bit. So yeah, that's a, that's a special place for, for my family particularly. So it's interesting that you've, uh, that you've actually been there. It's, it's one of in my opinion, one of the most uh, beautiful places in the world. So, yeah. Yeah, it's so nice. I mean, I always thought that Byron Bay is my favorite yeah. place in Australia, but then I went to Noosa and I was like, well, this is actually quite yeah. nice. <laughs> and especially to learn surfing because I was in this surfing school with one of the best, uh, I don't know, surfers in Australia, the world champion. I can't even remember what it was, it's been a yeah. while. But it's such a magical place and all the like the national yeah. parks and everything was just super, super Yeah, nice. it's beautiful. I mean, Tea Tree uh, Bay and Tea Tree, when you walk through those the trails, it's quite pretty. And they have got some great um, caliber surfers that actually live there. Um, and uh, I know an F1 Formula driver has a house there. 
Um, there's a lot of like uh, famous people that go up there and spend time. It's getting a little, a bit more uh, touristy now, but it was much, it was, a, it was a bit of a yeah. secret spot for a lot of people. If you were spending time in Australia, you would definitely uh, want to visit Noosa and of course Byron Bay. I love Byron Bay too, but uh, Noosa uh, was a bit more low key. So, yeah. Yeah, I love the acai bowls. In yeah, no, way. it's quite big actually. It was uh, acai bowls are uh, huge around Australia. There's a pretty much an acai bowl station nearly at every place around any kind of big mall or anything like that. So it's interesting because it's it's yeah, it's quite a popular thing. It's so funny they don't they they had it in Australia before they had it in um, Berlin, and now it's super big here. Everyone is having acai bowls, and when I was in Australia, it was like a normal how do you call them like this uh, um, car thing on the yeah. street where they sell it on yeah, the car, sell the car <laughs> and they, they give you samples or coupons to, to kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of get you hooked in onto it. Cause I know, uh, for example, my family back home, my brother has his coupons and my mum has kind of, you know, coupons for that sort of stuff to get it's the same with coffee and, and anything like that. It's very, uh, Australians like to get ahead of the game with that, I think. So it's kind of getting big in the States <laughs> yeah. here. I noticed, uh, in Boulder in particular, there's a couple of acai bowl places that people are raving about and it's just opening up. So it's interesting to see it kind of spread. It's cool. I, I, I quite like it too. I, it was one of the things I missed from home. Yeah, that was my next question. Do you miss Australia? I miss it uh, a lot. Yeah, I miss it quite quite a bit. I've been, uh, I've been over here with college and running for about four, five years, five years now. So it's been a long time. Um, obviously, Australia is a very isolated place in the world. So it's kind of hard to get back and forth, especially now with uh, with the situation going on um, with COVID. It's obviously with safety and health precautions, it's, it's kind of locked up a little bit. Um, I have to be heading home soon to get a professional visa so I can stay in the United States and train in this professional group with uh, on running. So I'll be doing that. So it'll be nice to see my family, which I haven't seen in quite a while and my, uh, my dog and yeah, obviously be able to surf, go home and surf and enjoy yeah. being back home because uh, you don't really notice it, but it, particularly with the food and the lifestyle and everything like that, it can be quite a shock change from uh, going to uh, Australia than coming to the United States. So um, it'd, be, it'd be nice to go back and, and, and go back and try some things that have changed and some things that have stayed the same. So looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. And you also don't have the proper Australian accent anymore. No, no, hey, I don't. I don't like hearing that. <laughs> uh, no, I've I've become. I'm sorry. I've, no, it's fine. I've become Americanized, uh, which is not great. Um, which is why I need to go home <laughs> or listen to more Australian shows. But uh, yeah, I've I've definitely lost a bit of my accent along the way. But hopefully, when I get home, I can kind of <laughs> claim it back a little bit. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, you will get there. I'm yeah, sure. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um. So, how come that you changed from swimming to running? What happened uh, there? It was interesting. Uh, swimming in Australia is it's a huge culture. Um, especially it's also also with surfing and kind of grew up swimming. My mum was a great swimmer and a water polo player. Um, and my brother was a great swimmer too. So we kind of uh that was a, an avenue for us um in sports. And I kind of fell into running afterwards as a cross training exercise so like cross country was my cross training for my swimming and then I realized I was actually quite good at it so we kind of pursued that avenue <laughs> and then I, I kept swimming up to my high school days and then once came to college I stopped swimming and, and fully focused on my running and that's where uh, it kind of blew up for me and I was able to get some great results get a name for myself um, uh, come out with conference championships national titles and all Americans and then Uh, progressing to a professional career, career here so it, it kind of it was a good um, outlet for me but yeah it was it was definitely a priority shift once I realized that running was definitely a uh, an opportunity for me especially coming over to the United States to to get an education uh, and also train so it was it was the best of both worlds and I noticed that um, that was going to take me further than my swimming so I kind of stopped it I do miss it but um, definitely happy and excited with where I am right now And it's super interesting. I have another funny story of my Australia trip because the family that I was living in, I think the daughter was a professional swimmer for Queensland. Oh, okay, yeah. And she always went to all the competitions when I was there. And then sometimes she was with us and she went for a run with us and showed us everything. And she was super, super fit. And I was like, oh my God, 
such a crazy yeah, swimmer. Yeah. So. No, they, they're, all, yeah. they're all fit and they can, they can all run too. So, no, nah, Queensland's got a huge <laughs> reputation for swimming. So, she uh, she must have been a pretty, pretty high class to be a professional swimmer in Queensland. So, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, could you just explain what cross, cross, cross country <laughs> and track is? And there's also a difference between indoors and outdoors. Yeah. What, what exactly is so i didn't actually know the difference between indoor and outdoors until i came to the united states um, but cross country is pretty much uh it's like a trail run but it's it's around a course um it's hilly it can be grassy it can have you know uh dirt trails anything of that complex and it's just a course that's usually for the men it's about eight to ten k for the women it's usually six to eight k uh kilometers and it's just a trail running race and you get you can get max up to 200 people in this race and they, they all take off and run. Um, it's quite big in the United States with the NCAA. It's, it's decently big back home in Australia. And I know it's decently big in Europe too. There's European championships and then there's American championships and Oceania championships. Um, it's not an Olympic sport, but it's, it's definitely a, I guess an avenue that a lot of professional runners go into because it's good training and it's good base training and also great racing because you get to compete against a lot more people than you're used to um, in a track race uh with indoor track uh it's inside um with america obviously being an australian i didn't experience that it actually gets quite cold here and it can snow <laughs> and obviously that's not the greatest uh outlook when you want to be running fast so when you look at it uh indoor was a great idea and and the americans and europeans uh do it quite a bit and it, it can go from a 200 meter uh banked track so it kind of looks like a a race car track where it's up on stilts so it helps you with the bend. So it's not as aggressive with the tight turns. Um, and they have races on that 200 meter bank track. They can have the 800 meters, uh, the mile, which is 1,609 meters, the 3K, 5K, um, sprints, hurdles, jumps, all that sort of thing. So it's similar to track and field. It's just kind of abbreviated. Uh, and that's quite big. It's usually during the, the winter season. Um, and, uh, you know, there's big races in New York. I raced the Milrose Games. In New York against uh, is it a big European runner that uh, people might know is uh, Philip Ingebrigtsen, um, who's quite big in Norway. He uh, was running there, and we had a couple of Europeans come from Great Britain. Um, we have a German runner as well, Sam Parsons, who's actually based in Boulder, Colorado. Um, he runs uh -huh. too, <laughs> and so like that was kind of the indoor season. It's quite short, and then we go to the track and field uh, season, which is the the big oval that's usually around the uh, football fields. Um, which is you're running around and it's a 400 meter track and that's probably where you know uh, the, the money comes in where people uh, really want to perform well is the outdoor track and fields to make the Olympic Games, um, World Championships, Commonwealth Games, anything in that particular fashion. It's probably the most competitive with your Diamond Leagues and, and other big prestigious races. That's usually when people want to be competing, uh, in competing well. So um, for me, I compete in the middle distance events, so mile 1500, and then I've done a 5k too. Um, but that would be the event that I'm going for uh, in the Olympics. I ran the Olympic standard uh, in Tennessee a couple of weeks ago. It was a 334 for the 1500. Unfortunately, it doesn't uh, qualify because the period is now frozen with with uh, COVID. It doesn't open till December 1st, but it's exciting. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. I'm really sorry. No, it's fine. I mean, the, the one thing that is, is exciting is that joining a new group like On, which is obviously developing some fantastic shoes and some fantastic gear and having a very athlete based um, performance brand that wants to, you know, be excited about getting into the track world to, to, to kind of do that for them and already have a, a classified Olympic standard under the belt is, is a good thing for the group. And I mean, if I can do it once, hopefully I can do it again. <laughs> and uh and qualify for, for tokyo um so you know obviously we're in the right direction and we're excited about that um we had some great races through the se season uh i guess i should talk about my um my teammates there's carlos villarreal who's from mexico uh he ran in arizona in the united states and he's a close friend of mine he runs in middle distance um he ran sub four miles this season so he's in He's doing well and in good shape. Then we have uh, Joe Klecker, who's, a, who's an American from Minnesota. He's got great pedigree from his parents. His mother's an Olympian. And uh, he ran a great 5K and a great sub-four-minute mile in Colorado, which 
was quite a big deal. And then uh, George Beamish, who's a New Zealander. Um, and as people know, well, some people know that New Zealanders and Australians uh, don't get on that well. Uh, we have a bit of a rivalry <laughs> and George and I know that. So we have quite a bit of banter and quite a bit of fun uh, with that competitive rivalry, but we're good mates. And he's running the 1500 5k, um, but he's currently just in training right now. And then uh, we had a couple of races go through and we ran the first sub four minute miles in Colorado at about 15, 5,400 feet, which is quite high. So we were excited to do that. And then we ran, the Tennessee race for the 1500, ran the Olympic standard, went to LA, ran a 5K in that smog and ran a big PR in the 1330s. And then another, I ran another mile, which was a world leading time of uh, 353 for a few weeks until I got broken by a fellow Aussie. But um, it was a good season. And then we're excited to kind of open up this brand with on with OAC. And hopefully next year when things start to turn into more of a normal process, we'll be a, uh, representing in Europe and hopefully doing uh, on the on brand and everybody involved proud. So we're excited to be a part of that. And obviously it's a new thing. So we're trying to get our brand out there as much as possible, considering the uh, conditions that we're in. Yeah. yeah nice. Um, so going back to the beginning, uh, can you tell me more about the uh, Australian cross, cross country championships from 2015? Yeah. So I, uh, <laughs> So I, I was. I read something yeah. about it, and I thought it could be quite interesting. Because <laughs> I was, I think it was an under, under twenties cross country national championships, and this was, I think I was, I was eighteen at the time, and I was wanting to get over to the United States, but I needed some sort of credential in my own country, um, and we ran on a uh, a horse race course. So, as you can imagine, there's a uh, horses make big imprints in the ground, so <laughs> you can roll your ankle through that. And uh, it was a difficult, oh, no. uh, difficult race, but we we're racing against New Zealanders too. And I, uh, that was my first kind of breakout race where I won and I never had any kind of confidence to go in a race and win something like that, especially being underage. And I came through and had a great race and won. And uh, that kind of propelled me into the sights of the U S and obviously into other races. Uh, but it was an interesting race because I think it was my, it was my only, it was my first kind of national title in cross country. And, running around a uh, horse course and through kind of all those avenues, you got to watch out for the potholes that the horses were making and uh, they made quite a lot. So it was interesting if you were watching, I think my parents watching through and hoping that I wouldn't um, hit the ground at any point, I'll be stumbling through that. Like a lot of people did because that in those races, there'd be about 80 to 90 people. So um, it was a free for all, if anything, uh, but it was a quite fun experience as a young man. And, obviously gave me a lot of confidence going into other races later on, but uh, Dan, that was my, that was probably my breakout race as a runner. And that kind of race told me that I could um, end up here, end up as a professional athlete. Uh, and it was an exciting experience. So it's one of those races I definitely look back on and think, wow, I can't believe I actually did that. So, yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. imagine. Congratulations on that Thank one. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how come that you went to America? So you went to the University of Wisconsin, is that, that is, right? Or did you go somewhere else? Before? No, I went to the University of Wisconsin. I, uh, so I was looking at colleges in the United States because I felt like it would be a great opportunity to be able to go on a full scholarship, uh, still run competitively in a very competitive um, kind of established NCAA program and obviously get my education without my parents paying for it. I thought that would be a nice thing for them um, because I think- <laughs> Well, you're fast enough, yeah, so. <laughs> I, I was, <laughs> I thought if anything, you know, like as anybody knows growing up, I mean, parents do a lot for you. They wake you up at ungodly hours to go training or take you around, drive you around places when you don't have your license. So to give something back to my parents, particularly, I thought it'd be nice for them to take a, a four or five year break from me and uh, not have to pay for my education. So <laughs> um, anyway, I, I looked at a lot of schools and. Wisconsin jumped out to me because of the heritage of the program, especially with distance running. Um, I had an already, I had already a teammate, an Australian uh, boy called Morgan McDonald, who was already there. And the coaches were both Irish. Uh, they knew me as my, as an Australian and they were quite um, accommodating for international um, athletes coming in. So that was just a no brainer. I loved the place and I really wanted to obviously get a good education and also be able to continue my running. And it was just a, 
a no brainer with that situation to be able to get my degree and continue running was, was a very uh, privileged opportunity. And I was lucky to have it with uh, the university of Wisconsin. So, yeah. Okay. Was it your only choice or did you look at other universities? I looked at other universities. I looked at um, the university of Arkansas, university of Villanova, um, university of Los Angeles. Um, I looked at a couple of other universities around. I looked at Stanford. I looked at all the, all the, the kind of the big universities and they're all interested. Um, but you can only visit three. And I visited the university of Florida It had a very, very good reputation. I visited Wisconsin, um, which I loved and, and just mm -hmm. ended up going there. I visited, uh, Iona, which is a university in New York. And I loved Iona too, but my mother had never been to New York in her life and she always wanted to go. So I picked that one so she could go to New York and have a great time there, which she did. Um, and she's been back since, obviously, with me racing there. Uh, but yeah, I had options. I also had options to stay at home and run professionally for Nike. Um, but I think for me, I wanted to invest in my, I guess not my brand, but my, my future, especially my intellectual capital. I think for me, it was important um, to, to have, an, have a good degree coming out of out of college and still be able to run. I think that was an opportunity that they didn't really have in Australia. I could have, I did get into the university of Sydney and yeah, academically a great school. And I would have been able to do well in, in my major, which was journalism at the time. And then obviously run professionally for mm -hmm. Nike. But I think the whole experience of going over to the States, being independent financially and independent with my running and my academics was a good skill to learn. <laughs> to be able to go out and, and look after yourself, I think was something that I wanted to uh, challenge myself with. And also I think the opportunity which I've now received with on would have never came if I didn't uh, go through that process. And obviously the people that I've met, the uh, relationships that I've had and the traveling that I did, you know, I, I traveled in Europe. I lived in London for, for a little while and I, you know, was able to get those opportunities because of my reputation and my, uh, going to Wisconsin and, and training and competing for Wisconsin in the NCAA and my education. So um, all of that kind of definitely paid off in the long run, but I did have opportunities to stay at home. I just thought my parents might enjoy me being away for a while. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so talking about the NCAA, what about uh, 2018? The yeah. The national title. Yeah. Been. I was, what was it? The... Yeah. I was, a, I, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> Um, I was a, I was a sophomore, so, uh, I was in my second year of college and still kind of, uh, getting used to things. Uh, but my, de I, my development with my coach, uh, coach McBurn kind of grew exponentially. I started to win conference titles. Um, I was an all American in indoor and in, and in cross country and then coming in to, uh, the NCAA season, the big outdoor season, it was a big, uh, historic moment because, uh, any track fans know that the Haywood field in, in Oregon is quite a prestigious field. It's where um, Steve Prefontaine ran, ran a lot of his uh, American records. A lot of international Europeans have, have run at the pre-classic and broken countless uh, records there. So it was a prestigious track and they were actually remodeling it for the uh, world championships coming, were supposed to be coming in 2021. So um, it was a big opportunity to kind of go after and, and try and win a title and, I kind of came through as quite an underdog. Not many people knew who I was or didn't know how to pronounce my name. Um, and Aww. then coming through um, that final, obviously if it is on YouTube, but it's quite extraordinary. I think I was in, it was a 1500 meter race and there was one lap to go. And I think I was in about eighth or ninth position. And then from that race, I moved up all the way up to about third or fourth. And then the last home straight, I was from fourth to first and I won my first national title, which was, <laughs> a crazy experience as a sophomore. Um, I still had, I technically still had two years of college and to have that kind of uh, exposure and, and that kind of win against some crazy competition. Um, Josh Kerr, for example, who was a finalist at the world championships in 20, uh, 20, 20 2019 um, and a couple other boys who were ex uh, great professional athletes in their own right. Um, it was huge. And uh it was an exciting experience and it kind of projected me to realize that oh, I can actually become a professional runner. I can hopefully one day represent my country of Australia uh, at the Olympics and hopefully, you know, represent a brand and be able to run for them. So it was one of those things that kind of, it was like the 2015 cross country championships in Australia. It was like, Oh wow, I can actually uh, 
can actually do this. And I pulled it off. And then mm. from there I was, um, people knew how to pronounce my name and I kind of <laughs> created a brand and was able to keep running and do some uh, great running for the next year and a half until, uh, until COVID hit and I had to cut my um, collegiate career short. And then obviously, uh, unfortunately, leave, co leave college uh, collegiately to race and then go professional. So which, which is what I did this year. So. Yeah. So did you finish your journalism? Yeah. Oh, so, <laughs> so I actually went to economics. I actually became an economics major. Oh, okay. um, I journalism was quite big at Sydney university and I wanted to uh, pursue it. And then coming to America, I didn't realize I had the option to choose what I would like to do. And I was very interested in economics because I realized that um, it was a great universal degree as an international um, to learn about the world and the economy. And then I knew it was a much more flexible degree for me um, if I was to be a professional runner to work for a company um, later on in my career when I have to hang up my spikes and retire. So uh, I definitely took that career kind of avenue into more of an account and I wanted to, to do economics. And that's the major I ended up with, which I graduated uh, this May which was awesome. Uh, I've, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, my parents... <laughs> so you weren't able to celebrate? No, right? no, I wasn't. Actually, it was... Uh, I was actually... Uh, it was a wild story because my parents were supposed to come over um, and obviously there's a big... There's like a track meet and then the, they kind of, you know, have a homecoming thing where you have your your Harry Potter robes, that's what I call them, and your, and your hat and everything. <laughs> and uh, you kind of go through that whole system of graduating. My parents, you know, my... My dad never went to college. Um, you know, my mom did and she wanted to, you know, she wanted to, to get excited about me graduating in America. Um, but unfortunately, it kind of didn't happen with, with COVID. Um, there's a lot of stuff that kind of went wrong for me that season and, and for a lot of athletes. Uh, but obviously the indoor championships my senior year, it was a big year for me to, I was looking forward to hopefully winning a mile title indoors um and then i was going to go home for the olympic trials um in march but you won the race or in no so this was this was this year this was this year it was oh, okay, it was supposed okay. to happen um joe klecker was supposed to run the 5k um hopefully he'd win, win his title carlos was running against me in the mile and so was george so all my teammates were were competing and trying to to win a national title um and then when covid hit Uh, the United States, they cancelled the national meet. I had to make an uncomfortable phone call to my family saying, I can't come home. Um, I can't come to the Olympic trials, which is one thing we had planned for quite a while. Um, and it was just a whole mental reset as an athlete. It was, it was quite difficult because you plan stuff out, you know, and, and things don't come through and something like this is uncontrollable controllable and inevitable. And you want to make sure that everyone's safe and, Unfortunately, the uh, NCAA season was over, so there was no more outdoor track and field. Um, I only got to compete in for Wisconsin for three and, a half, uh, three and a half years, when I usually get four, and I graduated. So that was it for me. I had to look for prospects and get an agent and sign a professional contract, but a lot of other people lost opportunities as well. And I think for me, it was tough because I couldn't go home um, and haven't been home since. So uh, it was a crazy shift. And then all of a sudden on running pops up and says, Hey, we want to create this track group. Um, we want to obviously have a global outreach. We want to bring this brand to every part of the world. We have all these on ambassadors, um, these people working for on that, you know, want to get excited about building this kind of base and, and kind of putting themselves in that track scene where um, Nike, Adidas, um, you know, New Balance, a lot of those big brands have already been there and on wanted to jump in and, they obviously wanted us to be a part of it and be the face of it. And that opportunity itself kind of opened the doors to the races that just unfolded and the opportunities that we didn't get um, having our college uh, seasons and our college careers cut short. So that was an exciting aspect. And like, I think the one thing that I learned throughout all this, and I know I've been teaching my friends is that when one door closes, another one opens, you know, there's always opportunities that come through. So um, that's kind of, the transition of what on was able to do and to grab these talent athletes and to obviously with safety and being able to find meets that were um, COVID tested and safe to kind of perform. So um, it was, it was a crazy ride through this year, 
up to September to get to where we are and we're excited to kind of keep going and, and definitely uh, race as much as we can and hopefully get to Europe at one point and race. So, yeah. Yeah, it sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were talking about All-American earlier. Yeah. Could you explain what that is? Because I know that it's not a big thing in Germany yeah. or in Europe in general. So I think they don't really know what that is. Yeah, so an All-American doesn't mean you're an American. Um, which is good for me because I like being an Australian. Um, but <laughs> an All-American is pretty much, uh, I, I'm an 11-time All-American, which means that um, I've been top eight in the nation for certain events, um, finishing top eight. So once you finish top eight in the United States, in the NCAA, you get an All-American, which is like a certificate. Um, and it's quite prestigious here, especially with, consistency and, and being up in like rankings so like if you're ranked you know if you win or if you come eighth you're in the all-american bracket which means um you're you know a pre you're in a prestigious kind of group of people um for that event so it's kind of like a finalist um if you're racing in a race and you're, you're top eight and you're in that final then you could be an all european or you know all all german uh 5k runner it just means that you're the top eight in that event at that time in, in the country okay that's interesting okay thanks um i heard something <laughs> i had a lot about you were talking about um running and why you run and then you said at some point um you run to find another excuse to eat more food yes so i have to ask uh, what's your favorite food at the moment uh, that's a good question i love all food i i have a problem with uh stopping to eat um i love it yeah i just love eating and it's a problem that's why i run as much as i can um at the moment i love trying like i me and my roommate we're both Australian and we're obviously in a new city. So we love to try ethnic food, new food. Um, there's like Tibetan places around here that I love. And I love like the vegetarian dumplings. They're called Momo dumplings. And they've just got you know, like cabbage and, and carrot and just all different types of greens. And they're in this dumpling and then they can fry them or they can uh, steam them and you can dip them in like these spicy sauces and stuff. It's delicious. Um, but I love, there's like a Nepalese restaurant, which is uh, Nepal, Tibetan food as well. Um, and they make great curries and um, noodle dishes and, and everything like that. And I love that type of food. I love Asian food. I love Indian food, kind of ethnic kind of food. Um, but I do love, um, as, a, as a German, I apologize to you for this, but I do love chicken schnitzels. I don't know if they're like, it's like an actual like, Americanized thing, but I back home in Australia, chicken schnitzels are quite big. When you go to a pub, and you know you can get a beer and you have like a nice big fat chicken schnitzel with um, chips and salad. That's one of my favorite meals because it's 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 big, and I love chicken. So um, I'm not sure. I've been to been to Germany and I've tried the schnitzel in Germany and it's pretty fantastic. I've been to beer gardens as well and the food there is quite big. And insane and I enjoy that so that's why I love uh, Germany I think I was in I was in Berlin I was in Munich um, I'm not sure I was in another place as well it was a small town with cobblestone streets and stuff and it had really good beer but it had really good brats as well like the brats were insane I think I ate like my weight in brats and pasta so when I was in Germany singing singing in the halls with the big big mugs I tried to take one with me but they wouldn't let me so got in trouble for that but um all types of food i enjoy I'm, i'm my roommate's quite a healthy eater so i'm trying to learn from him how to like cook much more healthy dishes um i think one dish that i learned from him was a moroccan tagine which was a pretty cool dish um which is like a lot of mixed like vegetables chickpeas um and it's like couscous and you can you can add chicken if you want or you can have a vegetarian and that's one dish that I, i have learned from him that i actually quite enjoy that's actually quite healthy and not chicken schnitzel and chips, but yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm really interested in the food and everything about like nutrition and athletes because I'm a nutritionist in training yeah. and I will, yeah, learn a bit more 
afterwards to become a sports nutritionist and it's all plant-based stuff yeah um yeah so it's quite interesting to like hear that from your perspective yeah i mean um it's interesting that you mentioned that the nutrition aspect of, of athletes because they do take it very seriously and i think i noticed that a lot of athletes want to be educated more into it and i think having people involved in that in, in, in a nutritionist sense is quite important and i mean the plant-based thing is interesting that you mentioned because we've been trying i think with the group in particular we've been trying plant-based um supplements so um protein endurance protein like different type of uh plants-based uh supplements to use for us instead of you know collagen or anything like that we've been trying to use different stuff to try it out to see what it's like and um yeah that's that's interesting you mentioned that because we're we, we want to get more informed on that and obviously having the idea of what what to pick and and what situation is best for you especially with your diet um is important to a lot of athletes so we're definitely looking at that right now especially as a group because you know we can't all eat chicken sizzle and chips all the time so yeah we're trying to work on on bettering ourselves in that regard yeah well life is a process exactly so. <laughs> good on <you>. exactly <laughs> okay so uh, you mentioned that you have a normal race day what what would you eat before you go to your race um usually a lot of carbs um at that point the one thing that i learned as an athlete is that there's a lot of things um you can mess up and it's nothing to do with with running like i think eating well getting good sleep um if you can is is important i know a lot of people would struggle to sleep before a race because they're so excited um but for me i i love To, to try and eat as normal as possible before a race. Um, I think the one thing that I, I've heard, I've heard rumors about like don't eat sours, don't eat plant-based stuff because it's hard to process before a race and you can lose energy during that. I think that's a load of baloney, to be honest. I think if you eat whatever you're usually used to eating, especially when you're in hard training, it won't mess or won't disrupt your translation to a race. Um, for me, I like to eat carb-based things if I can get you know, a good pasta dish, uh, make sure I have, you know, a good salad, good veg, you know, fruit is also good. Um, but before a race, I think you can do whatever you want. Like, I mean, the day of the race, you want to eat probably stuff that isn't too spicy. It's going to mess you up. You know, when you got to line up before the race, you don't want to eat anything too, uh, too fiery and too hot because you'll regret it later. I've done that personally. Um, but usually just very, very basic food um, is also important. Um, Also get your protein in a couple of days before, um, keep your carbs up, keep your vegetables in. Don't, don't freak out about the process of vegetables. They're always important and uh, fruit. And then after your race eat as much chocolate and lollies as you want um, and enjoy that kind of break until you, you know, get into it the next day and eat normally. But uh, a pasta dish is usually the, the best option. And that's the option we usually go for when we're uh, obviously in different cities and trying to figure out a place to eat. So, yeah. Yeah, I had the same thing when I went to uh, New York last year for the marathon. My whole group was eating pasta and I was the only person with like this huge plate of potatoes because I'm a potato oh, fan really? and I needed my <laughs> potatoes and my beans. Yeah. <laughs> But everyone else was eating such a huge plate of pasta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I also heard something about visualization and I wanted to ask you if you do that, if you if we do that what do you actually do and if you have any tips for athletes or people who like to be faster runners or something like that yeah uh, visualization is a thing that i kind of learned throughout my my running career I, i learned it a bit in swimming as well and it's kind of just the mental preparation towards a race um to kind of literally visualize the race how it's going to pan out what you're going to do at certain parts of the race. Um, for example, for me in a 1500 meters, you know, you want to have a good start. You want to make sure that I'm not on the inside, not trapped in behind other runners. I want to be on the outside. I want to be relaxed. Um, you could also visualize when you're going to hurt, like, you know, it could be three laps in and you're at this point where you go, okay, I know it's going to hurt at this point, but I'm going to focus. I'm going to stay relaxed and keep pushing through, trust my training. Um, and then you can visualize when you're going to kick, when you're going to put in that final surge, um, that final kind of fast bit of the race at the end, you want to make sure that, you know, you can visualize where you're going to do it, when you're going to do it and, and kind of have that feeling in your head. 
um, from past races. And I feel like that's very useful for me because it gives me kind of a, a preview of what, what's going to happen. Um, not, not every race goes the way it's planned. And I think you should be going in on instincts. Um, I know a lot of runners uh, kind of when things don't go their way, they, they start to kind of lose their mental focus. And I think the one thing to do is to stay relaxed and, and not to panic and, and to trust your training. But mental visualization for me was always important going into any race. Um, for example, with Tennessee, I wanted the pacer to go out in a 154, 800. So I was visualizing myself at that pace, where I was gonna, how I was going to feel, where I was going to be hopefully behind the pacer, uh, staying relaxed. And then once that pacer drops off, mentally switch on and um, try and keep that pace going and then hopefully finish strong. So um, it's, an, it's, it's a, I think for me personally, it, it's been a very important skill to learn. It's an important thing that I think athletes understand that like every race doesn't always go the way you plan. You know, sometimes you have days when you don't feel very good um, and some days you feel a million dollars. And I think the way in which you go into a race is to obviously you're there to have fun. You're there to, you know, race fast, um, be competitive, get excited about it, but also to, to do the best that you can. And the mental visualization always gives me an idea of where I want to be and what I want to do. Um, and it can give you obviously as well, people get quite stressed and quite nervous and it can actually relax you. Um, you know, you have that mental readiness pre preparation um, with excitement you know, it helps you stay ready and excited, except for like nervous and excited where you don't know what's going to happen. Kind of if you mentally go through it, it'll, it'll give you a bit of um, an idea of, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to expect. So um, that's what mental visualization is. And that's what I learned throughout college with racing, um, just to be able to kind of go through that process. And it helped me relax. It helped me get ready for a race. And it was kind of a traditional thing for me to do. Um, and I still do it now. And I probably will continue doing it as a professional runner. Do you also use mantras when you were in the race? Um, yeah, sometimes I do. Um, it just depends. I think for me, I've done a few uh, big races where I kind of didn't expect something to happen. Um, or, you know, mentally I've, I've kind of gone into a dark place. And I know a lot of people, when that happens, it's hard for your body to keep, keep going um, when you kind of, putting yourself out of the race. So I think for me, it's the one thing that I've learned from, from my group in particular, and being in Boulder, um, struggling to get air at altitude is to kind of just keep your, keep your mind switched on, keep, uh, keep pushing and remember like, why am I putting myself through this much pain? Why am I doing this? Um, I want to do this because I want to, you know, make the Olympic games or I want to run a personal best. And if you're a runner that wants to, um, you know, breach some goals and breach some goals, it's a great, great way to do it and I heavily encourage it um, because I, I feel like it's, it's always for me whether it's a good or bad race it's always paid off and it's always something that you can learn and, and take advantage of later on in, in racing so could you you just mentioned altitude could you just explain us why it's important to train there and what it's, what it does to yeah you? so I am um, altitude is being high up in the mountains um, Currently in Boulder, where I'm based, it's about 5,400 feet, which is quite high up. Um, the higher you're up, the less oxygen there is in the air, which means it's harder to, to get in that oxygen to get your blood going, get your muscles moving. So um, your hemoglobin count starts to increase when you train a lot of altitude. And then when you come down, um, you have that built up of rich hemoglobin that helps you uh, not struggle as much when you're in like, you know, high, high aerobic or high anaerobic uh, situations so a lot of endurance athletes marathon runners um and i mean me as middle distance runners still get benefit of training up in altitude because it gives you much more of a, a strength in your in your hemoglobin also when your vo2 max which is your um, oxygen intake um as a runner it's it's a great kind of place to train because it makes you stronger it's very hard and i think i my first week here walking upstairs i was out of breath and i thought i was a fit person so <laughs> Uh, it takes a while to get used to. Some people acclimatize a lot better than others, um, but it's a it's a great place to kind of get harder training without kind of pushing the body or the the weight bearing aspect of running uh, too hard. So 
Um, obviously, I've, I've been here for a few months and now I've, I've seen when I come down from altitude to race, um, it definitely benefits me. I don't feel as heavy or as tired. I feel much more uh, in control of my body when I'm still at a very hard or fast pace, able to push through that. So um, altitude is where a lot of elite groups are based. And uh, I know that on running has a, a base at, at St. Moritz in Switzerland. And I think our team will hopefully one day, once things calm down, go to Europe and, and train there and um, obviously meet the people at, at on running in that headquarters. But um, it'd be a great place to train in Europe because it's quite a high at altitude as well. And, uh, good, good training. Good to keep obviously the oxygen level low, so you can, when you come down and it's high, you're so much more receptive in a race. Yeah, I can imagine. Nice. Okay. Um, you also mentioned patience. Could you just uh, tell me why it's an important fact? For you? Um, I think for me, patience is a is always been a virtue. I've noticed that um, when you rush into things or when you take things a bit too intensely and you want to um, get after it straight away sometimes it might not go the way you planned or you might not fully fulfill what your aspirations or what your goals are. So I know for me in particular, for example, like when I moved into to this apartment here in Boulder, I wanted to have everything set up straight away. I wanted everything sorted out, but sometimes you can't let like, that can't happen. You get tired or you'll hurt yourself trying to, you know, set up Ikea furniture or anything like that. So um, patience in, in life is, I think is an important thing that I've learned, um, especially going through my my uh, my college, my running and coming to as a pro, you know, I could have gone pro with Nike straight away out of high school, but I didn't want to. I wanted to be patient and see if opportunities, better opportunities and more opportunities to, to the person I am would come through. And that was kind of the avenue that I was trying to force myself to sit and wait and, and prepare. And I think the one thing is the more you can absorb of, knowledge or if you're training and and the more you learn about yourself then those goals can become easier to acquire and you can acquire them the appropriate way um for me i've always wanted to hit the olympic standard um since running and winning the national title two years ago um when i went to europe i was pushing too hard to try and get that standard and i noticed that um i got great advice from my my dad who said you gotta let it come to you you gotta not chase the time you gotta be patient and let the training absorb and Two years later, um, I didn't really have any competition to, to run that time, but I, I got a pacer and ran it solo. So I was able to achieve that goal as a rookie pro. And that, to me, realized that, like, you know, sometimes patience is worth it. Sometimes you're not ready for a certain aspiration or a certain goal in your life. But if you um, build up foundations of, you know, your, your knowledge and your training and even bad, bad situations where you've failed in that, you can learn from it. Um, that building block will always give you a good place to be when you can achieve that goal appropriately. So when I talked to on running about one of the biggest things for me, I think patience was a big one. And um, it's the same with the Olympics. I mean, 2020, I know for a lot of people were a lot of their years where they wanted to run fast, but now they've got to be patient. They've got to wait and, and stay safe and hopefully keep their training up. And then 2021 hits and you'll get your opportunity. So um, that's kind of my, mantra and my outlook with it and for me so far it's worked out well <laughs> so, yeah 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 i can absolutely agree because um i moved to my apartment last week as well and i'm also still building all the furniture yeah. and all that stuff and i tried to organize everything before but you can't organize every everything before and yeah i had to laugh a bit when you said that because yeah I'm the same thing it was the same <laughs> thing with uh morgan and i because we we only had a, we had a moving truck, a big van, so we could actually buy furniture from Ikea and store it and take it back. And we were trying to do all that in the two days we had the moving van until we had to drop it back. And setting up Ikea furniture, you can really hurt yourself. So I got a few bruises and a few scrapes trying to set up our couch and then my, my bed frame. But it, it paid off eventually. But yeah, you know, it took a few days. I wanted to do it in, the, in that day alone when we moved in. I wanted some, something to sit on. But you know, like, you know, it's fine. We ended up getting it all done and, and being all fine with it. But it's, uh, yeah, that's my best analogy for it, I think, is the Ikea, Ikea furniture setup. If you're patient with it, it'll pay off. If you're not, you're going to hurt yourself. And, and if you have tools. Yes. I had no yeah, tools. And I wasn't tools. able to no. finish my bathroom. <laughs> yeah, we had, to, we had to go and buy tools as well. We, we forgot that we actually probably needed a screwdriver and a, a drill for a lot of things. So, 
that was extra extra cost we didn't realize we needed we thought oh we could do it with our hands no you can't do that no, no you can't no. it was it was quite funny figuring it out initially but we're all set up now so yeah <laughs> yeah nice <laughs> i also read something about um that you like to brush your teeth before yes, the race that is something that i was hoping wouldn't come out to the public but i like to brush my teeth <laughs> too, late. too late now i like to brush my teeth um before races because i like to feel minty fresh and i feel like sometimes <laughs> you can freak out like i i think i have one interview i i uh i won a race um in michigan and there was an interview and my parents watched it And I had, uh, I think I had beans or something before and there was beans in the, the side of my teeth. And at that point, I didn't brush my teeth. So that was the issue. And so now without fail, I make sure I brush my teeth before I leave. Just because if there's anything extra hanging around, I can get rid of it. But also because, you know, you, you feel good when you brush your teeth when you're going out. And, you know, I'll have my shot of espresso or whatever I need to get the caffeine in. And then I'll brush my teeth and feel good. And, you know, it's, an, it's a thing that I, I do now that, my teammates make fun of me for so yeah but i think it's i think it's a good thing i think it's a good thing well at least you will always have nice pictures exactly that's what i aim for so make sure my <laughs> teeth aren't covered in um excess beans or chicken's nestle so yeah <laughs> you um you also mentioned the um entrepreneur thing yes you? Uh, I think that was quite interesting because I'm studying a business administration and uh, I will do my major in um, sports management or entrepreneurship. So I was actually quite interested in that one. So could you uh, tell me more? Yeah, I, I had an idea of, I, I, I come up with these random ideas and I, I kind of want to get into that setting. I was doing, looking at going back to school and, and doing my entrepreneurship um, and business management. But I kind of had ideas like, you know, kombucha bars so like you'd have kind of Ooh. beer garden bars but they're actually kombucha and it'd be kombucha on draft so it'd be kind of like going into a, a pub and we'd sell alcoholic kombucha but also regular kombucha and it could be a place where you can pick up um stuff like that and it could also be a bakery and a coffee place make pickles pickle things i don't know like i had all these ideas of doing stuff like that you know my roommate talks about it as well like he wants to set up a a boutique like a little french motel hotel like on the coast somewhere in france and he wants to do all these different things and i was the same same with the group like we wanted to set up um kind of you know a base segment program that we could like have followers watch us um do training or exercises and they can jump in and, and follow and things like that so like i'm always kind of thinking of ideas like that I had a terrible idea um, that was called the radio comb, which is pretty much a comb which would have a radio in it when you're brushing your hair. It's a terrible idea because everyone has portable speakers now. But at the time, I thought I was a genius and I wasn't. So that, that idea is no longer being pursued. But other ideas like the kombucha bar and, and the, the boutique that my friend wants to do, like where, you know, that's, that's stuff that we kind of want to achieve in the long run if we can ever get the chance. But yeah, I... I like to look at things and think, uh, what could, you know, what do people crave? What, what would be a good thing that people would be like, I'd love to go sit there, get a draft kombucha and, you know, maybe sit on the beach and watch the surf. Could be a kombucha bar. I would love to, to get a kombucha at your place yeah. or at your uh, kombucha It'd be a bar. good bar and we'd have good names for it and, you know, Salty Mermaid or something like that. We'd name it after, you know, fish or some sort of thing like that we could, definitely work on i think my title of the store was going to be called slippery gypsy and it was going to be we're going to have a place in byron bay or a place in uh in noosa or back where i'm from in Cronulla. Oh, so yes. yeah that would that be the plan but that's so far away from europe you you should go to switzerland yeah i'd probably set one up in switzerland close to close to the headquarters set one up in berlin i think berlin would be a good place for oh, yeah. it yeah you could set that up i can do the, the social media yeah stuff exactly that'd be perfect <laughs> we can we'll start a business and get it get it running next thing you know I'll be be popping up everywhere like a side balls be everywhere <laughs> <laughs> okay um i also wanted to ask you something um when you think of runners you think of uh, injuries <laughs> that's what i thought when i was starting to read a bit more about runners and uh, do you have something that you can tell a runner or something that you 
that could help to recover faster from injuries or something? Is there anything you have in mind? Yeah, um, I think the one thing to do is to know your body. Um, when you feel a niggle, when you feel a pain, usually for me or for any other runners, it's something else. You know, maybe your hamstring is, is really, really sore, but your quad is quite tight. So your quad needs to be stretched out. I think knowing your body, um, I highly recommend yoga. I highly recommend being able to... Oh, I'm a yoga teacher. Oh, really? Damn. Okay, well, I don't know <laughs> yeah. anything about yoga, but I do a bit of it. I did a bit of it in college. My roommate does a bit of it too. And um, stretching, doing drills, um, rolling out, knowing where your body is, and sometimes taking a break, um, I think is the most important thing to prevent injuries. Um, if you're talking to your coach, keep open communication. Even if you have a niggle, um, make sure he knows about it because he could be able to tell. Sometimes you can't tell when you're running, but they could look at your form and say, hey, you look a bit off. Uh, an important thing is just to be aware of, of where you are and, and don't, you know, don't push things and strain things too much. Sometimes taking one step back is better than taking, you know, three, three steps forward when it comes to pushing an injury. Cause the next thing you know, you could be out for six weeks or you could get a tear or a fracture or anything like that, which could cost you quite a lot of time of recovery. So the one thing I learned is that sometimes the body will tell you where, okay, you need to take a break, maybe a day break or a couple of hours. Don't, you know, don't stress things out too much. And it, for me, it's always turned out to pay off in the long run. So, Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's really important to listen to your body because the body knows better. Body knows better, <laughs> exactly. So we were talking about the lockdown earlier and I would like to know how you train during, or I'm not sure how it is in uh, America right now, but how was training like and what do you do? Uh, it was tough, but it wasn't too much different um, than, than usual. I, I wore a mask. I still wear a mask around here um, when I'm running near people. When I'm usually out in a trail where there's no one around, I'll take the mask off and then um, put it back on when I'm near people. Um, but um, training, obviously, you're not training in big groups. You'll train maybe two of us if we're known for each other. Um, we'll get COVID testing, um, usually quite a bit, to make sure that, you know, everything's fine. We don't have to isolate or anything like that. Avoid, obviously, you know, seeing people going to crowds, which has been, you know, kind of tough for everyone, I can imagine, not being able to hang out in a social setting, not be able to go to a concert or hang out with friends at a bar. I understand it's been difficult, but other than that, you know, just being safe and precaution has been important for us. We make sure that we're around the same people and training with the same people, um, which can get boring. Obviously you can get sick of some people sometimes, but uh, other than that, it's been great. Um, we haven't- Especially when you have a New Zealander. Yes, in your and that's been, that's been difficult for me. I've struggled quite heavily, um, but you know, <laughs> We've been, we've been, we've been killing it. We've been fine with that. We've just made sure that, you know, it's been nice here in Boulder because you've been able to drive out and get away from people and not be too much of a risk to anybody else or not have risk put onto you. So mostly for us, it's just wearing a mask and making sure the group stays small and we go to places that aren't too uh, heavily populated for us. Yeah. Okay. So how does a normal training day look like? When do you wake up? What do okay. You do? Um, so I wake up at about usually seven thirty. Um, I race my roommate downstairs to the coffee machine because we both wake up at that time. Usually, um, do some activation stuff. Um, then I'd go for a run, uh, be usually maybe nine miles, um, which is about 14, 15 K do some drill strides. And then I'd go, at the moment, we don't. Our gym is getting set up. Um, On's putting some stuff up for it, but we're going to a, uh, a my coach's garage, and we'll do our gym gym lift there with all his equipment that he has. So that's quite funny seeing that. Um, but we do our lift for about an hour and a half. Um, then after that, obviously, get some some nutrition in, whether it's supplements or we get you know make some food. Um, after that, maybe take a little nap, take a little break, or you know, go through some things, emails, whatever we have to do with, with product testing or anything like that. And then in the afternoon, have a shakeout, which is about a four mile run. So about seven to eight Ks. And it's just a, a light jog around listening to music or podcasts or whatever you want to do and have a jog around just to shake out the legs from the run before and then get back, have dinner, socialize if you can with, you know, limited people that you're used to socializing with. And then, usually read a book and head to bed. So that's pretty much a, a, a normal day. And then sometimes, you know, throw in a workout or throw in a long run. And that's usually the process. Um, it can vary, obviously, depending on if we travel further up into the mountains or we go to different locations. Um, 
but yeah, that's pretty much a typical day. And did your training change since you went or since you were become a part of uh, the Yeah, it definitely it has. I went on to a new coach um, and obviously being in a different place, um, training did change a little bit. Uh, it's still very strength based training, which I'm kind of used to from college. Um, but I was running in college about 85 uh, at, at my high points, 85 to 90 miles a week. And at my low points, about 60 miles a week. Whereas with this group, I'm thinking I'm going to be running 70 miles at a low um, pace and then up to a, probably about 95 to 100 miles um, because it's my job now. So I don't have any excuses with homework or schoolwork, even though I might try and go back to school depending on how expensive it is. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's definitely changed for the better. It's just a much more of a intense setting but we still have a lot of fun uh we still crack jokes it's still the same kind of feeling that you get when you run with a great group of people um but definitely at that intensity it's, it's, it's another level and that's a level that we obviously want to reach as professional runners yeah that's interesting um was the tennessee race the first race with the yeah it was the first official race we had an unofficial time trial in boulder where we ran the sub four minute miles um which on kind of i was supposed to be announced later on the week but unfortunately i ran really fast and they said well we can't hide this anymore because i was wearing the full-on kit with the spikes <laughs> so they're like well and they they, they posted about in the stories they said well we couldn't hide this any longer because of how he ran in the states and then i got introduced and then the next week we went to tennessee and i ran the olympic standard so um, it was kind of a wild two weeks because on, on running kind of blew up and, um, you know, I was able to get, uh, I got a bit of a following on Instagram and I got, you know, friends from back home in Australia or around the world, you know, they said, oh, we love on shoes and on running. And, and it was a cool experience to finally be able to come public and announce my professional career. So uh, it was a crazy two weeks, but it was very exciting. How did it feel to say it officially that you were part of the on group? It felt, it felt crazy. I think for me, I, I signed a contract in May um, with on with my agent. And at this point I, I was still getting used to on and, and, the, and the product. And then when it came to um, July, when I, when I got announced, I was like, Oh, just announce me already. I just want to be like, I, I want people to know that I'm with this brand because I think the more I got to work with them, the more excited it, it made me to see how much they progress, how much they, um, they put back into their products, um, the quality that they, they put through and um, everyone's just, you know, so energetic and exciting and they're working with me, which I know with a lot of big brands like Nike, um, Under Armour, Asics um, and Adidas, they don't really do that with their athletes as much and to have on to do that and be the ground floor of, of, of a lot of testing with product is, is just exciting and I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be announced and I wanted my family and friends to know because at this point they thought that I had gone missing in america so that was an exciting uh, thing to do yeah like you said earlier it's all about having patience. exactly yeah and, that, <laughs> and that's where it came through i had to stay patient and wait but unfortunately obviously they want to announce me later in the week but the race kind of blew up and they're like well we better announce you now so yeah okay so um how come that was it joe with the sub four minutes yeah now? so how come that you were running the kind of race or what happened there? So Joe, Joe had always wanted to break four minutes in the mile in Colorado. It's never done, never been done before, before we did it. And there was something that was important. Um, Joe is much more of a 5k guy and he wanted to do it based off strength. And I was a middle distance guy. So it was kind of my specialty. So we had um, a pacer who was supposed to go through for 800 meters. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it that fast. So then I took the lead and I kind of just, took off from there. I was in great shape and was confident that we could do it and ended up with a uh, 356 mile. And then Joe came through behind me in a 358. So he was able to break it, which was a exciting thing for us to both be the two first guys to do it um, in Colorado. So he uh, went to Colorado University. He's been there for quite a while and had, had quite a following in Colorado. So it was a big deal for him to be able to achieve that goal for himself mostly. Um, and I was happy enough to be able to be there with him and obviously do something that was quite big for me too to be able to come up to altitude and only train for a month and be able to do that was uh was it was a crazy feat and we were very excited and obviously it was it was cool to see where we could go and Tennessee and then LA uh happened and yeah we were able to get some races in so we were in great shape and we were excited to be able to do it 
Congratulations on that Thank one. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, could you tell me more about your relationship with uh, your coach? Yes. Yeah, so Dathan Ritzenheim is a bit of a, he's a bit of a legend. He's a three-time Olympian. Um, he was an American record holder in the 5K and he was a marathon runner too. So he uh, had an amazing career. What was his time in the marathon? Uh, Do you know that? Two oh, oh, I got to look it up. I think he ran 2.05. He's very, he was, oh, wow. he was very, he was a big, what I, I like to call him the big dog uh, in American distance running at the time. <laughs> um, he was obviously a huge legend in America. Um, his marathon, sorry, his marathon was 2.07. His half marathon was an hour. And um, yeah, wow. So he was, he was an amazing athlete um, and obviously went through a lot of injuries, a lot of setbacks. He was with Nike for a while. Um, and learned a lot with them. He trained under the Oregon Project where uh, Mo Farrow and Galen Love trained. And then he kind of came out of there uh, quite a while ago and went under Brooks running brand, ran with the Hansons for a while, and then became a, became a coach. Um, and obviously, you know, as an athlete, he was fantastic, but I didn't really know him much as a coach. And then I got to know him a lot better and he's been fantastic. He uh, really gets where where you come from um in this business as a, as a professional runner and it was just exciting to be able to work with someone who's you know he's been there he's been at the top of the game um he's been to three olympics and he knows exactly what goes on and what it takes to get there so having a coach that's been through that process i know myself joe george and carlos feel very comfortable um having him kind of lead the ship and putting us in the direction of where we want to go so it's been fantastic so far Oh, that's amazing. I think, especially with this whole new environment, it's quite important to have a good relationship with your coach and with the team in general. So I think you will, you will do amazing things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, we're, we're excited. Um, we're excited. Yeah. What, is there something coming up? Are you training for something at the moment? At the moment, I have to go back to Australia um, to get my P1 visa and then I'll train up for the Olympic trials for Australia. They've been rescheduled um december 1st is when the period opens again so i know um uh, my coach dathan will be wanting me to race end of uh end of december or sometime in december to run an olympic standard uh so that's probably the goal for right now we're, we're just going to be getting into some hard training um testing out some product with on um obviously the group's got a lot of ambitious goals we want to make the olympic games not just for me and for australia but for carlos for mexico george for new zealand and joe for america so If we can all do that and achieve that goal, then we can have a whole, you know, on running kind of onslaught or onto the Olympic Games. So that that's our plan. We want to kind of make our mark on the professional world and kind of show this brand um, in one of the most, you know, watched uh, events in, 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 uh, in the world, which is the Olympics. So that's, that's our goal. We're going to find some fast races in December and hopefully um, get through those and, and end up uh, in Tokyo. I hope yeah, so. me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have I have one more question. Then I want to uh, ask you a bit more about the running on running thing. Um, is there one specific runner who inspired you the most in the? Um, yeah, there is. His name is. Um, he's actually not a. He's not a distance runner. He's a sprinter. Um, his name's Peter Norman. Um, Oh, I heard his name. Yeah, before. so he he's quite big with the the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. He was one of the guys. So there's that famous photo with the two African Americans who have their fist up in the air with a glove, black glove, and they have it on both separate hands. Peter Norman was the guy that gave them the gloves, and was the guy that stood with them um, during that protest. Um, when he went back home to Australia, he kind of got out casted out last year's career was over as a runner he, he was a silver medalist in the 200 meters at the olympics and was an amazing talent but because of what he stood up for um because of his beliefs he was kind of pushed to the side that now has been rectified um he's a massive hero in australia and is obviously a big um pinnacle for equality um he died um a few years ago but i was fortunate enough i was at a conference and i met Uh, the Olympic champion who was standing on the pedestal with him. My roommate and I, who were both Australian, came up. We wanted to talk to him, but he, he was there. He was talking to our group. And um, 
we got to meet him and chat to him and talked about Peter Norman. And, and that was an inspiring thing for me that I think he was inspiring because, I mean, athletics is a, is a great opportunity. It's a great privilege to be able to be a part of, but to be able to do something, to stand for something and to, to um, you know, do something bigger than yourself is, is something that has always inspired me as a runner. If you have that platform and you want to um, promote change and promote equality and happiness for everyone, I think that's something that Peter tried to do, to do and tried to achieve. And that's why he's always been a hero, um, not just to me, but to um, generations of Australian runners and Australian athletes. And uh, yeah, he was a big inspiration for me, just being able to be like, you know, you do do what you do, do what you love and, and stand for what you love. So um, he was an amazing, talented athlete, so hardworking. And uh, he's a guy that I definitely looked up to growing up. I wasn't a sprinter, unfortunately, and not fast enough. But in the distance side, that's definitely something that, uh, you know, as an athlete, he was a very inspiring person, inspiring runner. Yeah, nice. Okay. Um, so talking about on, how come that you're now in Boulder, Did you reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? And how was this whole process? So the process went through where they reached out to me um, very earlier on last year, um, interested in, in signing me, not for a group, but just to sign me as an athlete. And then it kind of snow, snow rolled into a big whole idea of creating this track group. And it was going to be based in Boulder, Colorado, because it's probably in America it's known as the Mecca of, uh, of running. Like a lot of people come here to train and they want to base it here and they want to have yeah. kind of their footprint into, into Boulder. And that was a big deal. And so I'd have to move, which I, I did with my roommates um, who also runs here in a pro group. Um, but we kind of, I kind of was interested in that idea of interesting building a group together and starting this group of young, young people who have already run world-class times to kind of, create this base, create this footprint for, for on running, especially in the United States, but also globally in track and field. So um, it kind of came about as, as that pitch. And um, once I heard um, Dathan Richardson was going to be the coach and Joe Klecker and Carlos were going to sign with them, I was like, this is, this is going to be an awesome opportunity and I'm definitely going to take it. And then since then, it just kind of grew into this great um, force that uh, we were able to kind of achieve a big footprint here in Boulder. And we already uh, kind of well known as a, for on running and it's really helped us and helped them. And so far we're looking forward to seeing it um, kind of, you know, skyrocket. And uh, it kind of came around that process of like, Oh, we want to sign you as an individual athlete. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, we can do something greater. And that was to build a group of a global outreach of athletes um, and base it on the professional stage. So um, that's how it kind of came about. And they, they reached out and expressed interest. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to take this opportunity. Nice. So you decided to join on because you had something like a right to say something about your career as well, not just I'm following your plan. Yeah, yeah it, it was definitely to yeah, be able to nice. make my mark and being, being an Australian runner for, for, for on running was cool because then it can kind of relate back to people in Australia looking at on brand and hopefully, you know, um, that bringing in and, and being an exciting new outlook for a lot of runners in Australia. So, Yeah. So the most important question, what's your favorite on shoe? Oh, um, I think the Cloudflow, the new Cloudflow, we tested it. And uh, it's one of the shoes I love the most because it's very light. And it's just, it's, it's a lot more comfy. I love the Stratus as well. But the Cloudfly is probably my favorite. I like the Cloudflow too. Um, I like, all the shoes have been fantastic, to be honest. A lot of the performance shoes are great. There's still a little couple of little tweaks that they need to work on. But overall, it's a great start to where they are. But the cloud flows are my absolute favorite. So I run them all the time. I have like four pairs in my Yeah, room. mine too. Mine too. I love the cloud yeah. flow. But I thought that you would say the cloud boom. Oh, the I boom. I it's more the fast. Yeah, no, the boom's been yeah. quite fun. There's a, there's a shoe that I can't mention yet um, that's coming out that I've <laughs> tried. It's, it's similar to the boom. And it is fant it's one of the best shoes I've ever run in. It's a fantastic shoe. I think On will be releasing it soon. They've got to tweak it a little bit for regulation. But... As a performance shoe, it's going to be up there with obviously the Nike 4% and the Nike uh, yeah. shoes like that. They're trying to make sure that I uh, can, can challenge it. And their first attempt already has gotten me excited. I've been, I've been training in it quite a bit and it's been, uh, it's been awesome. Nice. Yeah, so look out for that coming out soon. <laughs>
So they're always talking about running on clouds. Do you have the feeling that you run on clouds when you have that? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. But other times I feel like I got rocks in my shoes, um, which does happen because <laughs> I do get a couple of rocks in my shoes. You know, so. you know what happened this weekend? I was working for on because um, a guy was running the, um, the speed project. Have you yes, read about I, yes, it? Yes, I did. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, he was actually um, here earlier and we recorded an interview together and I was showing my shoe to someone and I turned it around and it had this huge rock or not like, yeah, like this huge rock in yeah. my shoe sole. And he was like, well, this couldn't, this, this is not a yeah. good shoe. I mean, there's this huge thing in it. And I was like, oh my God, in this moment, I turned the shoe around and there was something in it and normally there's nothing yeah. in it. And I was just super embarrassed <laughs> that moment. And I was like, no. Yeah, it'll sneak up on you. Why it'll now? sneak up on you. You don't realize you've got a shoe on you. Um, rocking your shoe. And all of a sudden you look up in the screen there. So, yeah, you got to, like, other than that, like, they usually don't, doesn't happen. But sometimes you can you can collect some uh, some casualties along the way on your run. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you, you said that you have a roommate, but you're not living together with Carlos and Joe. No, right? no. Car, Joe lives with his girlfriends and Carlos and Jordy live in our house uh, down the road. I live with my Australian uh, teammate, Morgan McDonald. He uh, runs for Team Boss and he's under uh, Under Armour. But we've been, he went to University okay. of Wisconsin. We've been mates since we've been young. So we're pretty close. And he was also coming out to Boulder. So it kind of was a perfect fit for us. Yeah. Okay, but when you train, you train together with the yes, on group? Yes, I train with the on group. Every day? Um, some days. Uh, some days I, try, I train with Morgan just for, just for regular runs if you're going out for a run. But for workouts, mm -hmm. for lifts, for all the, everything else, I train with the on group, yeah. So it's been pretty fun. Nice. Okay. Is there anything that you want to add? Is there something that you that someone should know about you or about on um i guess just to look out there'll be um some shoes coming out that i mentioned that we've been we've been trying out and we're really excited for them to get released um and that's pretty much it i mean like i mean we're, we're excited to be you know a big face for on uh, especially in the track world and we're hoping that in the next few months that we'll be able to get into some races and uh really you know show off the brand so it's, it's been fantastic and we're just excited to be a part of the team yeah i'm thinking or i think that you're doing a good job in general and i'm super excited where it will take you and the group and on um i have some questions in the end that i ask everyone but before i ask them i would like to like where can people find you can you tell us a bit about your instagram or do you have a website yeah or so something? you can find me i mean if you go on the on website and you click on athletes i'll be i'll be on there as oliver um and if you want to find me on instagram my instagram name is ollie Hall, so it's just o double l i h o a r e uh, my twitter is uh o double l i e h o a r e so a little different there but um, they're all linked together on my accounts. Um, and that's how you can find me on social yeah, we'll media. Yeah, we'll put your Instagram in the show notes. That yeah, so that's you. how you can find my social media. Um, and obviously, if you want to see more stuff about On and about my teammates and the group and, and what we're trying to achieve, it's all on the uh, On website, which is pretty awesome. And it's also, there's a link under my uh, profile where you can click onto it and see everything. So um, On's done a pretty good job with that. You can, it's pretty easy to find all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay, nice. So now I have three questions for you. First question, a book that inspired you? Oh, um, there was a book that I read not too long ago. It's about, um, it's about an athlete. Oh, crap, I can't remember the name of it. Oh, um, how, how bad do you want it? um it's a it's a running book and it's about all these athletes have gone through setbacks and they and they get and they kind of achieve through things it's quite funny because uh my agent's actually in the book so i make fun of him for it but um <laughs> it's just a book it has a lot of these athletes and they go through their training their nutrition um setbacks that they've had how they achieved them or you know big injuries that, that they've had to go through um through pretty difficult times and it was a book that i mean like the title says how bad do you want it it kind of goes through these athletes and how you know they want to achieve something i think bigger than you know just a, a gold medal around their neck they wanted to achieve something for themselves the physical aspect and it was kind of an exciting read that's one of the books that's definitely inspired me and it's a it's a great read we, we read it in college um it was in the locker room and it was just yeah it was it was fantastic 
sounds super interesting i love all books about like runners and athletes i need to get yeah that. i recommend it it's a great book um, all right uh second question what excites you in the morning after waking up uh coffee <laughs> making coffee <laughs> you're that's the same thing that he said earlier uh, what's going on with you <laughs> um i think honestly making coffee and making bread like making a good meal to start the day is always exciting um, I also get excited about looking on YouTube and finding funny videos to watch while I'm making my coffee. I think that's one of the things as well that excites me. Um, but yeah, that's probably it. Unfortunately, it's probably very mediocre. But... I, I can't believe that everyone is saying yeah, I coffee. Know. Coffee's <laughs> a big thing. I like, I like my coffee. So. Oh, I don't drink coffee. I'm more than much oh, a right. hot chocolate okay. person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the last question for you one thing that everyone should know about me or in general not just in general um, something that you learned on the way or something i think everyone should i think everyone should know about i mean this might be a bit of a um, stereotypical thing so everyone should know about the environment and where they live i think knowing like what you're doing where you're doing where you are um, how can you how can you improve things? I think is one thing that, um, in the environmental sense, is very important. Um, especially you know in the in the times we live in, you know, knowing where you can recycle, knowing where you can you know look after things, reuse things, donate things. I think is is a very important thing. That's one thing that I'm going to learn here is donations, um, making sure you know waste is not waste. And I think that's one thing that I always employ, and my roommate does the same thing: is to know where you are and know where you can do better in that kind of uh, climate and environmental setting. So, yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because I saw the, the story of on earlier because they released their yeah, the, the recycle shoe. shoe. Yeah. It's, it's a very cool thing. Um, hopefully yeah. there'll be more information on that later on, but uh, what they're doing right now is on the edge of, of uh, obviously booming out to a lot of other people trying to do the same thing. So it's a very cool, very cool idea that they have. Of course, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it so, so much. And I hope that people got a lot of value out of this. I wish you all the best for the future. And if you ever come to Berlin, let me know and I will show you around. And uh, yeah, I will try to find some good kombucha. Yeah, definitely. You. And, and that's definitely, evil. definitely. Thank <laughs> you so much. I appreciate your time and, and thanks for having me on your show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning in with me today. Make sure to let me know how this episode resonated with you by tagging me under at Eliza Licious Show over on Instagram. That's where you can also send me a DM if you have any questions or suggestions. If you want to know more, make sure to head over to elizalicious.de where you can find the show notes for each episode. And please make sure to pop over to iTunes and leave me a rating and review. And hey, if you like what you hear, check out my Patreon page where you can support my work. I appreciate that so, so much. Big thank you to Tanya Nocella for graphics and music by Temple Hayes. Have a wonderful rest of the day and I'll see you next week.